Hey everyone, it's Colin, how's it going? This iMac recently crossed my path and it's got a little bit of a problem to it. How about a casual video where we go through and try to suss out what's wrong and what it'll take to fix it. So this is a 21 and a half inch iMac. And even though it's a mid 2013 model, which places it at this point at eight years old, it's actually still not that bad. It's got a quad core i5 processor and eight gigabytes of DDR3 memory. This is however, kind of a low end machine. Apple did sell the 4K like retina display models in this size at the time, but this is the base model from its lineup. So it's only got the 1080p display. That said though, it still is a very usable machine, except for one particular problem that this specific unit is having. And that problem is this. If I power on or reboot the machine, Sometimes, but not always, it'll just hang when starting up. The progress bar will get like halfway across and then it'll just stay there. Now, I've already gone ahead and wiped the hard drive in this computer and reinstalled the OS several times. Typically, if a computer is just kind of hanging like that, a lot of times it's just corrupted operating system, something along those lines. But in this case, and chances are it's going to boot just fine because of course I'm filming it and that's just the way it works. But sometimes it just gets stuck regardless of what version of the Mac OS I reinstall on here. I even went through disk utility when booted off of a USB flash drive and fully wiped the hard drive. I gave it a complete zero pass. So not just a quick format, but literally wiping the entire machine and even after that, reinstalling the OS, it still would just freeze. Sometimes it would just boot multiple times in a row just fine, like you see here. Other times I could get it to fail multiple times in a row. But either way, an intermittent failure like that really isn't going to fly. I mean, I don't want this machine to end up in someone else's hands with the expectation that it's usable and reliable just for it to like half the time not really want to work for them and they have to keep rebooting it until it eventually works. That's just, that's just not good. So considering the software isn't really seemingly a factor, that makes me suspect hardware. Okay, so I try to run the built-in diagnostic utility. You power the machine on and simply hold down the D key on the keyboard and it'll boot into a special recovery mode and run its own self-test. But knowing my luck, of course, it didn't come up with any errors. It went through all the systems, ramped up the fans, tested everything out, and it couldn't find a problem with the hardware. I realized that every time I booted from a USB flash drive or internet recovery to perform those functions, it was fine. The computer never hung when trying to boot from those other two sources. It was always after the OS had been installed and it was booting off of its own internal hard drive that it would have that intermittent hang. So that got me thinking, maybe it still is a hardware problem, but just one that the built-in hardware diagnostics doesn't really test for. And here I think is exactly what's going on. Now, with a machine of this era, they often ship these with what's called fusion drives, where there's a mechanical hard drive with a small SSD to act as a cache. So if you go into system information and click on something like NV Express, if it's got a fusion drive, you should see the SSD in there, but nothing shows up. If I click on SATA and SATA Express, there's only a single entry. Medium type says rotational. So there's only one hard drive in this computer and it's a mechanical drive. I suspect there's something going on with that mechanical drive that's intermittently failing. And since Apple hardware test doesn't do a complete scan of the hard drive when it's going through its test functions, 
it's likely going to miss an intermittent failure like that. Now that actually gives us a bit of an opportunity because it's a mechanical hard drive, it's definitely not gonna be fast. And what's worse is in these 21 and a half inch machines, the mechanical hard drive is a two and a half inch unit. It's a laptop drive. And it even says under rotational rate, 5,400. So even if the drive was reliable, this thing is definitely underperforming compared to what it's capable of. And we can even prove that if I quit system information. And I've already copied over this Blackmagic disc speed test. Let's see what kind of performance we get. Oh, wow. Yeah. 33 megabytes per second on write and in the 70s on read. Okay, we're going a little bit faster on write. It's kind of getting itself there, but look at the inconsistency in the write performance too. Read is always going to be a little bit faster on mechanical drives, and that's usually the case with SSDs as well, but as it cycles through its test, look at how different of performance we're getting on the write speed. I definitely think that's an indicator that there's something going on with this drive. So here's a great little project. We're going to go ahead and swap that mechanical drive out for an SSD. Okay, so of course I started by unplugging the machine. Now getting inside one of these iMacs has changed over the years based on the different revisions. The very first aluminum iMacs up through the 2011 models were actually easier than these. Those, the front glass is simply held on with magnets. So you use a couple of suction cups and you can pull the front glass off and then you undo a few screws on either side of the LCD panel and then the LCD panel comes out. Starting with the 2012 models, <laughs> Apple decided to go a different direction and the glass and LCD panel are fused together, which is both good and bad. The bummer though is they used adhesive around the edge to hold the display to the case. The screen still needs to come off in order to get at the components inside but instead of it just being held on with magnets and screws, now you've got this thin double-sided foam tape basically that runs around the perimeter. So you not only will need a kit of replacement adhesive strips for when you put the screen back together and iFixit sells that, this video isn't sponsored, but I've had good luck with their parts and tools in the past, but you'll also need a special tool in order to cut that adhesive at least safely without potentially damaging ribbon cables. And the kit includes what basically looks like a little mini pizza cutter. The cutting wheel gets slid between the seam of the glass and the aluminum back. And the diameter of this cutting wheel leaves just enough of it exposed to cut through the adhesive but not go too far into the machine. And I'm just gonna work my way kind of up and around that seam and it's just gonna cut through the adhesive. Now that cutting wheel does a good job, but not necessarily a perfect one. You can still see some remnants of the adhesive holding on in there. So you just kind of got to go back through. I'll just use a spudger and uh, try to cut those little stringy bits of the double-sided tape that still remain. Now, once you get the adhesive cut through, you can't let the display fall too far forward because you've got a pair of ribbon cables in here that are still holding it up. And if the display were to fall forward, it would damage those connectors and or just tear the ribbon. So the top one is like, for I believe the backlight and such and that just pushes straight in. The other one is the actual video connector and to release this one you flip this little metal tab over it just swings 180 degrees and then the cable pulls straight out. So now I can fold the screen down and what's kind of annoying is there's still adhesive 
at the bottom of the display down here. Um, so you have to cut through that. You can maybe try to get the pizza cutter thing going. And I should mention, be careful around this part. This is the power supply. If the computer's unplugged, you're not going to get a major electric shock like from AC mains voltage. There are, however, some big capacitors on here, and some people are a little paranoid about getting hurt from those. Supposedly, you can hold down the power button after the machine's been unplugged for something like 10 seconds. That'll, in quotes, discharge those caps. I don't know how effective that actually is, and I'm sure all sorts of nerd debate is going to rage down in the comments below from that. But I'm just going to say, try not to touch any of the contacts on the backside of this power supply if you can help it. OK, I mean, obviously, with this whole project, you're responsible for your own actions. Um, but I'm just going to try not to touch the power supply and I, I, I should be fine. So you can try to go in here with the pizza cutter and, and cut this adhesive. Um, that may be more trouble than it's worth. I think I'm just going to go with the spudger and just kind of scrape through it as best I can like that. And then eventually the LCD panel will just come loose. <laughs> In typical Apple fashion, there are some things to think about when doing a hard drive swap in an iMac. I'm lucky in this machine, the 21 and a half inch models with the two and a half inch drives, you can basically just swap the drive straight out and the machine will be fine. On other models, however, it's not quite so straightforward. Older iMacs, like the 20 inch and the 24 inch models, the, you know, the Intel ones, they have little stick on thermal sensors. It's basically a little thermistor with two wires and they just use a little bit of double sided tape to just stick that physically on the drive and the computer will read the temperature of the drive along with other, you know, thermal components inside the machine in order to know how much to ramp up the fan. Starting with the 2010 models, however, Apple started to change things in that they began reading the temperature directly off the drive itself. In those 2010s, that little two wire harness plugs directly into the diagnostic port on the drive and the software running on the drive, its firmware will actually report the temperature sensor out that two wire connection. With the 2011 models, Apple actually had the hard drive manufacturers add custom firmware just to the drives that shipped with those machines. So it wasn't like any drive you pulled off the shelf at a store. Only the drives that shipped with the 2011 iMacs had this special firmware that allowed them to report the temperature data through unused wires on the SATA power connector. The bummer with doing that sort of thing, either with that two wire connection on the diagnostic port or going through the SATA power connection, is that if the computer's motherboard doesn't get the temperature data it's expecting, it assumes there's something wrong and blasts the fans at maximum speed. And if you've ever heard the fans in an iMac going max speed, you'll know they get loud. Now, there are solutions to that problem, especially on the 2010 and 2011 models, where you can either get special third-party software that allows you to manually control the fans in the machine, which is a little bit of a hack and may or may not be a good solution. The alternative is there are actually third-party little inline sensor modules that you can buy that go between the SATA power connection and the new hard drive and will report that correct temperature data. They basically kind of do like what the 2006 through 20, 2009 kind of models do where they've got a little stick on thermal sensor and then they kind of report that data in the way the computers are expecting it. That I believe is also still the case with the 2011 and up 2017 inch machines including the 2012s where they, you know, the machines got a lot thinner. But the 21 and a half models, for whatever reason, just the 21 and a halfs, they don't do that. Apparently they don't really care so much about the temperature of the hard drive. So as far as I can tell, you can just go ahead and swap the drive out and it doesn't really matter. You don't need to do anything special. 
So it's just four T10 screws. Unfortunately, some of these I believe are different lengths. So you probably need to keep them sorted correctly. And then this little cover comes off. And again, I'm trying not to stab the power supply with the screwdriver here. And then the drive is seated inside these like rubber bumpers, no doubt to dampen vibration. And then disconnect the SATA cable. And there you go, there's the old drive. So what am I gonna replace it with? Well, I've got this SSD laying around. It's 256 gigabytes. It's by no means the latest and greatest in terms of SSD technology. However, it's gonna work great and it's gonna be a whole lot faster than that old thing. It looks like these rubber bumpers, yeah, they're just stuck to the drive. <laughs> Which I guess is a very Apple thing to do. So one thing I'm finding is that this cable, they don't give you a whole lot of slack and it makes it kind of difficult to uh, try to plug the new drive back in. So if you need to, it looks like you can take this screw out and then this plastic tray can kind of tilt and give you a little bit more working room to plug the drive in. Now you're still gonna have a bit of a contortioning act to do with your hands to try to get the drive plugged in like that, but then have enough room to put that screw back in, but uh, it's doable. There we go, the new drive is installed, but I can't just put the screen back on yet. I still have to deal with removing what's left <laughs> of all this old adhesive. That pizza cutter did a great job getting us in, but it cut straight through the middle of this adhesive. So I've got to go around the perimeter and just peel off, you know, the chunks like this. And then also on the backside of the LCD panel itself. Okay, now to get the new adhesive strips installed on the machine. Follow the instructions that come with whatever adhesive strip kit you buy. You might be able to get away with just buying generic like VHB double-sided tape, but I think buying one of these kits is just the much easier and simpler way to go. At this point, I've gotten all my adhesive strips installed. However, and this is important, I'm not gonna take the backing off just yet. Obviously, we want to test everything out first, so I'm going to go ahead and reinstall the LCD, but we'll take off the backing for the adhesive only when we know everything is 100% good. Getting these connectors in is a little tricky because you kind of have to do it one-handed, and they don't exactly give you a ton of slack to do it. Even harder if you're trying to film at the same time. And then just to keep the display in place for now, I'm gonna use a few pieces of this white electrical tape, just around the corners, just to make sure that the display doesn't fall off, because if it does, you'll destroy those cables and or the motherboard, and that would be really, really bad. Okay, so I've got an Ethernet cable hooked up. I'm going to power the machine on and hold down Command-R. That'll put us into internet recovery, and hopefully we'll be able to reinstall the operating system. Okay, so everything's looking good so far, at least in terms of the screen, I didn't screw that up. Now, one thing that I kind of forgot about, internet recovery is a really neat tool, but it's a bit inconsistent in its behavior sometimes. Command R, most of the time, will give you the latest version of macOS that's compatible with your hardware. However, if the drive in the computer is completely blank, it'll do one of two things. It'll either give you that latest version or like what happened this time, it'll give you the version that originally shipped with the machine. Since this is a 2013 model, this appears to be 10.10 perhaps, based on the appearance. I wanna get the latest and greatest. So you can kind of push that along by instead booting the machine while holding down Command Option R. All right, that's much better. It booted me into a much newer version of macOS. 
And opening up disk utility, yeah, you can see the SSD right here. So, so far so good. We'll just erase it real quick. And cool. Successful. I'm gonna go ahead and get the OS installed on here and assuming that succeeds, then we'll come back, take the adhesive off the LCD panel and stick it down for good. Okay, so the hardware is all completely put back together. I've got a fresh install of macOS Catalina, which is the latest version available for this particular Mac, installed on the SSD and everything is nice and snappy as it should be. I've rebooted the machine several times. It never did that freeze on startup thing. So I'm pretty sure we've gotten that problem solved. There's one thing left to do. I've copied over the disk speed test app Let's see just how much faster this new SSD is compared to that original hard drive. Yeah, that's a big bump on the write speeds. Before it was fluctuating between like 20 and 60, right? Now we're in the 300s and reads are just touching about 500 megabytes a second. So even if the mechanical hard drive wasn't bad, I think swapping it out for the SSD just because of this better performance is definitely worth it. And that pretty much wraps this one up. I'm gonna go ahead and call it fixed. Yeah, it's a bummer that Apple is headed in that direction of using more and more adhesive and making computers harder, if not impossible to repair and upgrade. And it's sad to say things aren't going to get any better as far as I can tell but at least when it comes to this style of iMac, basically the 2012 through the 2020s, both the 21 and a half and 27 inch versions, a lot of 20s in that, it's really not too bad, right? The adhesive is kind of a pain, but if you get the right tools and with a little bit of knowledge, it's definitely doable and it doesn't really take all that long either. All that said, even though this is a machine from 2013, you know what? It's still quite usable. No, it doesn't have the latest and greatest specifications and features and all of that, but throwing the SSD in here definitely improved performance on this machine, arguably to a level of performance it should have had when it came from the factory, but regardless, even though it's several years old, I think that small upgrade was enough to give it a few more years of usable life. If you like this one, I would appreciate a thumbs up and be sure to subscribe. You can follow me on social media at thisdoesnotcomp. And as always, thanks for watching.